How's it going everyone? I hope you're having an awesome day. Welcome to the channel. I'm The Chain Baker and in today's video I'll show you how flour protein content affects gluten development in our bread dough. So let's go to the kitchen and have a closer look. There are quite a few different kinds of flour out there. Some have very specific uses, while others are good all-rounders and can be used in various applications. These are just the bags of flour I found in my local shop. So we got two bags of plain flour, one strong white bread flour and a very strong white bread flour. And it is the protein content that sets these apart and dictates how they are classified. The first bag of flour clearly tells you what it's for, pastry and thickening sources. It contains 9.7 grams of protein per 100 grams of flour. So that's a protein percentage of 9.7%. Next up, we have another bag of plain flour. On the packet, it indicates that it's best for pastry, biscuits, scones, pancakes, and sauces. But unlike the other plain flour, this one has a protein content of 11%. Next up, we have the flour that I mostly use in my videos. This is my go-to, I use this for almost everything. Strong white bread flour, clearly meant for making bread, and it has a protein content of 13%. And if you're making bread by hand, then this is a good protein percentage flour to use. Last but not least, we have a very strong white bread flour, and it says that it's made with Canadian wheat. North American flour is generally stronger, and this one has 14% protein in it. There are of course other brands and types of flour out there, and it'll totally depend on where in the world you are. They could have very different names, and totally different protein percentages. I'm going to use white flour for the breads in this video. But before we move on, let's look at a couple other types of flour. Like this wholemeal, or whole wheat flour. It contains 15.2% protein. The lowest protein whole wheat flour I've seen was at 9%. When it comes to whole wheat flour, I'd say the more protein, the better. Spelt flour, on the other hand, can be deceiving. You'd look at the packet and it would say 11% protein, but the balance of proteins in spelt flour is different than wheat flour. So a dough made with wheat flour at the same protein percentage will have stronger gluten than a dough made with spelt flour. And speaking of gluten, I got this bag of gluten-free flour, and when we look at the protein content, it says 5%, but this time it means absolutely nothing in terms of gluten. There will be no gluten whatsoever, in the dough made with this flour. Well, let's look at the dough that we're going to make today. It's going to contain flour, yeast, salt, and water. And all four breads will contain exactly the same amount of ingredients. The only difference will be the protein content of the flour used in each of them. And as ever, this is not a recipe video, so I'm not going to talk you through the steps here. We'll just play this in the background and stop whenever anything interesting happens. Because what we're really here for is to talk about protein. So why is protein so important in bread making? There are two proteins in bread flour that make up gluten. They're called glutenin and gliadin. When flour and water is mixed, those proteins combine to form gluten. Glutenin gives bread dough its elasticity. It's the ability to resist stretching. Gliadin, on the other hand, makes bread dough extensible. It gives it the ability to be stretched without tearing. So one of them makes it elastic without being stretchy, and the other one makes it stretchy without being elastic. It is the balance of the two that gives us the ability to handle and shape breads that are strong and can keep their shape, while still being easily manipulated into that shape. Let's stop a little bit and look at our doughs here. I'm using the flour in the same order that was on the table earlier, starting from the weakest on the left to the strongest on the right. We'll give them each 3 minutes of kneading. And of course the first two, the weakest ones, they will be the stickiest ones. Because they have less protein, they'll have weaker gluten and a dough like this is not able to absorb a lot of water. That also contributes to the stickiness of it. Now all of these are at 65% hydration, which is already creeping up to the higher hydration levels, especially when it comes to low protein flour. So to knead the dough like this, perhaps the stretch and fold method would be more suitable. And this will be exactly the same case for the 11% protein flour, although it won't be as sticky as this dough here. So generally, when it comes to wheat flour, more protein equals stronger gluten, but there are other properties that come with high protein content. As I mentioned earlier, it can absorb more water, it makes the dough more cohesive and stronger. This can help the bread gain more volume, and will make it rise more vertically instead of spreading out sideways. And that is why high protein content flour is more suited for bread making. A strong gluten network can hold more carbon dioxide. It is the gas expelled by the yeast that rises our bread. The more effectively the dough can hold the carbon dioxide, the higher it can rise, and the more of an open crumb can be achieved. 
It is also more resistant to the addition of fat and eggs, ingredients that inhibit gluten formation. If you were to make an enriched dough with weak flour, it would be very difficult, since the fat coats the proteins and inhibits the gluten formation. This is especially true when making bread by hand. Whilst with a mixer, you could get away with using 11% protein flour, because the mixer is doing the work. Hand kneading takes longer as it is, so using weaker flour would make the job that much more difficult. And regardless, since low protein flour creates weaker gluten, it will bring some disadvantages further down the line even after mixing. A weaker dough tends to spread out, and it can produce rather flat loaves. And it really doesn't hold up well once you start adding ingredients like butter, sugar or eggs. You'll end up with something with the texture of more of a cake than a bread. Which can of course be desirable sometimes. But generally, a cake-like texture is for cakes, right? And that is what low protein flour excels at. Because with the addition of fats, like butter, oil and eggs, the sponge or the dough becomes even more soft and tender. Ok, so I've finished mixing the four doughs. There's quite a big difference between them. The low protein one still sticks to my fingers as I touch it. As we move up, the dough becomes stronger and more cohesive. And just to avoid any confusion, top left corner is 9.7%, top right corner is 11%, bottom left corner is 13% and bottom right corner is 14% protein. Now if you have a weak dough, there are a couple of things you can do. First you want to use a bit of flour when you handle it so it doesn't stick and tear. And to build some tension in it and make it rise more vertically instead of spreading out sideways, you can shape it tighter and give it tighter folds. Folding during bulk fermentation builds tension in the dough. And to build in more tension and keep that tension, you can fold your dough several times during bulk fermentation. And if you'd like to see a more detailed video about folding, check out the steps of baking playlist on my channel. Now a stronger dough on the other hand doesn't require much folding. We don't want to tighten the dough too much. Because if it's too tight, it's not going to rise up as well. Same goes for the pre-shaping step and final shaping. A weak dough requires stronger and tighter shaping. But a strong dough should be left looser. Another thing you can do if you have no choice but to use weak flour is to lower the hydration of the dough. You would be surprised at how much easier it gets to handle. You could also try adding vital wheat gluten powder to your flour. I personally haven't tried it yet, but from what I've read, 1.5 grams of vital wheat gluten powder added to 100 grams of flour can increase the gluten protein content by 1%. Another thing you could do is try and find some whole wheat flour with high protein content and then mix it with your white flour to increase the available protein. So let's talk about whole wheat or wholemeal flour. It is produced by milling the whole wheat kernel. That includes the bran, the outside shell, the germ, which is the seed, and the endosperm, the inside part. The bran is high in fiber and B vitamin. The germ also contains B vitamins, some proteins, minerals, and healthy oils. The endosperm contains proteins, minerals, and starch. It is this part that is separated and milled into white flour. And it is the least nutritious part I suggested earlier that it would be best to use high protein whole wheat flour when making bread. This is because of its coarse texture. The bran in the flour has a shearing effect on the gluten as you knead the dough. That's why it can be more difficult to develop gluten in whole wheat dough. There is one step you can take to help out with this. After mixing your ingredients together, leave the dough to hydrate, letting it sit for 10, 15, 30 minutes. Let the flour absorb the water and the gluten and gliadin can connect and start forming gluten without us even touching the dough. And you can learn more about this in video number 2 in the steps of baking playlist. Write a quick note on other types of flour, like spelt and rye. Spelt flour contains less gluten in. It is the part that would make the dough more elastic, so spelt dough is more stretchy. So even though it may have same protein percentage, it doesn't mean that it's going to be as strong as wheat. When it comes to rye flour, Protein percentage means absolutely nothing in terms of gluten. There is no gluten to speak of. It does contain the proteins that would form gluten, but it is also high in a substance called pentosans. It is this substance that competes for water with the gluten-forming proteins. It takes the water away and prevents gluten formation. But saying that, rye flour is definitely not gluten-free, and it should not be consumed by anyone allergic to gluten. Alright, let's get back to our little experiment here. So far, we've gone through bulk fermentation with one fold halfway through, then a pre-shaping step where the weakest dough was shaped more tightly, then a 15 minute resting stage before final shaping, which is happening now. And you may have noticed the different shaping techniques used here. 
The first two weaker doughs were shaped using the stitching method. It includes a lot more folds and tightening. The other two loaves were shaped more loosely, using less aggressive methods. And you may have noticed that during fermentation, the weaker doughs were falling flat and spreading out sideways. The stronger ones kept a nice round shape. And that's why it's always important to tend to a weak dough and try and build tension into it by shaping more tightly, folding more tightly. Right, so we're ready for the final fermentation. And I'll give these good dusting of flour. I know that the cling film would definitely stick to the low protein dough. Now the way they rise and expand during final fermentation is not necessarily because of fermentation rate. It is the structure of the dough that makes it expand the way it does. And the tightness of the shaping also affects it. The weakest dough has spread out and expanded a lot. The 11% protein dough, puffed up less but it kept its shape, has shaped the second dough quite tight. The higher protein loaves have expanded more, but saying that, I shaped them more lightly. We can clearly see how flat the surface is of the 9.7% protein dough. It hasn't got a good chance of rising up in the oven very well. Tension equals oven spring, and we'll see the effects of this in just a minute. They may look quite similar from the top, although there are some clear differences. We'll leave them to cool down, remove them from the tins, and then have a closer look. And here are the results of our experiment. 9.7% protein equals a flat top loaf. It did not rise much at all in the oven. The 11% protein one, still weak, but it expanded more. And even tore open on the sides. This is most likely because of my tight shaping. And I could have let this ferment for a little bit longer. Now 13% protein, it has more of a dome on the top. It's got good volume. But the 14% protein one is a little bit smaller. And that could be because it's stronger and tighter, it didn't expand as well as it was baking. This could have also been left to ferment for longer. It is stronger and it can take more gas buildup. But I'm sure we're all curious to see what they look like on the inside. Starting with the low protein flour loaf. It has a nice uniform crumb with the little bubbles spread out more evenly. Kind of what you would expect from a cake, right? The 11% protein flour bread has a tighter crumb and it's more springy and soft. It's also quite a lot whiter than the other ones. Now the 13% one looks quite familiar. It has a richer color, nice volume and a soft texture. Now the 14% one has more air pockets. It looks kind of similar to the low protein loaf but the texture is very different. It is nice and soft instead of being spongy. You can really feel the difference between the first one and the rest when tearing them open. It feels almost dry in comparison. But at the end of the day you can make bread using any one of these kinds of flour. Certain types are best for certain applications, but there are steps you can take and things you can do to adapt. I know I'll be sticking to my 13% protein flour. It works for me every single time, and I know exactly the kind of result that I will get when using it. So what do you think of this experiment, and what kind of flour do you mostly use? Let me know down in the comments. And see more videos like this one? Click over here, subscribe to the channel, click right here. Thank you for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.